Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. More Alana Robertson Webb. Also known as Mythology Loves Horror. Goatman Story Growing up among the rolling green hills of Vermont meant that I spent a lot of time outdoors. Even though I live in the capital city of Montpelier, my choice of activities had always been camping, hiking, and swimming. Most of my outdoor memories are happy, but there was one experience I had that made me almost never go camping again. My cousin Corey and I were on summer vacation from high school, and we begged my mom to take us to our favorite campground for a few days. The next afternoon we arrived at Lake Elmore State Park, where a ranger gave us a map with available sites circled on it. And after checking them out, we settled on a lean-to called Ash. All of the lean-to sites at this park are named after trees, with Ash and Juniper always being our preference, since they were a little more private than some of the other sites. My family had been going to Lake Elmore since before I was born, and my mom and I both knew the grounds very well. Our first night was uneventful. Since it was the middle of the week, the park was almost deserted, which meant that Corey and I never had to wait for paddle boats to become available, and we got prime lake beach spots without having to get there early in the morning. The trip was perfect. Until the second night. My mom wanted to go home on the second day to check on my brother Nate, who hadn't wanted to come with us. So after dinner, she left. We knew she wouldn't be back until around midnight. So we knew she wouldn't be back until around midnight. So we entertained ourselves by making s'mores and playing card games. After a while, we got restless and decided to walk down to the lake. From the bulk of the sites, the lake is about a ten-minute walk. And Mount Elmore, which looms over the lake, is always beautiful at sunset. We made it down to the lake shore just fine, and we enjoyed the cool sensation of wet sand squishing between our toes as we built a sand castle. The sun was beginning to set in earnest, and we hadn't brought a lantern down with us, so we headed back to the site to grab one. I was ready to head back to the lake, but Corey suggested that we walk the trail that goes to the old fire tower at the top of Mount Elmore. Instead, I agreed, and we made our way to the outskirts of the campground where the trail started. An hour or so went by as we walked and talked, just enjoying the refreshing night air. The lantern gave us enough light that we didn't feel nervous, and we just made sure not to go off the trail. There was only one path for most of the trek, so it was easy to follow. At one point, a herd of deer came bouncing out of the woods near us their appearance so sudden that I nearly dropped the lantern. Corey, a bit spooked, asked if we could head back to camp. I wasn't ready to, but I wanted him to be comfortable, so I agreed. We'd been walking for about five minutes when we heard someone in the woods off to our right. It was clearly a person, since their rhythmic footsteps clearly didn't sound like an animal. It wasn't unusual for rangers to patrol the trails, even at night. And if one of them had seen us, they were probably checking to make sure we weren't doing anything illegal or destructive. We waited for them to appear, but the steps had stopped, and no one entered the circle of light we were in. After a minute, Corey called out a tentative, Hello? His voice quivering, slightly. I thought it a little odd that we couldn't see a flashlight by then but I shrugged it off and kept walking. If some weirdo wanted to be creeping around in the woods at 10 p.m. without a light, then that was their business, not mine. 
It was probably someone sneaking away from their family to smoke or drink or something, which could easily explain why they weren't coming forward to greet us. As we walked, I noticed that since the appearance of the deer, the woods seemed oddly silent. I can admit that by then I was glad that we were heading back to camp. We were about halfway down the trail when a voice called out to us, which we instantly knew was my mom's. The sound had come from behind us and Corey, and I spun around in unison. I shouted out a greeting but got no response. Corey looked at me, concern clear on his face. It made sense that it had been my mom in the woods, probably trying to get us back for all of the pranks that we had pulled over the years. But it was weird that she suddenly wasn't responding after having just called us. We waited for several minutes, occasionally calling out to her. I started to get mad because by then her little prank wasn't funny anymore and I was becoming unnerved. A few more minutes went by, and I was finally fed up. I grabbed Corey by the elbow and began to march back to camp, grumbling about annoying mothers and stupid pranks. Corey hadn't said a word, but I noticed him watching the woods around us carefully. As we reached the last ten-minute stretch of the trail, my mother's voice once again rang out behind us. It sounded strange, though, and I immediately thought she might be hurt. I spun around, the swinging lantern casting distorted shadows. I couldn't see anything but trees, and I didn't hear anyone moving around. I was slowly becoming scared. I just wanted to get back to the safety of the campfire. My attention was drawn to the lantern light reflecting off of something in a bush nearby. It was a pair of green eyes. But to my confusion, they were about eight feet off the ground. No animal around here could be standing that tall, even on back legs. What the hell? Corey echoed my confusion. We were both staring at this towering shadow, neither of us daring to move. After a moment, it stepped towards us, and our feeble hope that it was just a deer on its back legs was smashed. To this day, we still don't know exactly what we saw, but the word goat man is the best way I have of describing it. A pair of woolly legs and a fuzzy abdomen gave way to smooth humanoid chest and arms. The face was horrifying, a mix of goat and man that still haunts me. I watched as it opened its mouth, my mother's voice giving a cheery-sounding hello coming out of the creature. But it was warped and too deep. Hi, baby girl. Good morning, Lonnie. To this day, I don't remember getting back to the campsite. I remember screaming and running as fast as I could away from the creature, but that's it. I don't know if it followed us or tried to communicate further. And I'm not sure I want to know. We never did tell my mom or the park rangers about our encounter. We figured that they would tell us we were crazy or chalk our experience up to the use of recreational substances so it wasn't worth the hassle. Corey and I have both returned to Elmore since then, but neither of us has seen anything like that again. I've often wondered if we imagined the whole thing, or if it's some sort of weird dream. People don't usually share the exact same dream, though, right? Moss Glen Humanoid I'm 26 now and living in Pennsylvania, but when I was growing up, I lived in Montpelier, Vermont. My summers were spent hiking mountains, swimming in lakes, and exploring expansive forests. 
I knew that my state had bears and rattlesnakes in its more secluded, mountainous regions, but I never imagined that there was anything more terrifying than those out there. When I was 19, my friend Emily and I went to Moss Glen Falls for a day of swimming and picnicking, and it gave us a nice change of scenery from campus. The waterfall is located in Stowe, which is a remote town in Vermont that has a population of barely 4,000. Emily was from another state and, and had never really seen much of the area beyond our college campus. So I figured showing her some of Vermont's quaint location was in order. The day was perfect. We had packed plenty of food, sunscreen, and towels. And since it was a weekday afternoon, there was no one else at the falls except for an elderly couple who left not long after we got there. We spread out our towels on a large rock by the falls and alternated between climbing up the waterfall edges to get to the swimming pools and relaxing in the late afternoon sun. It was peaceful, and it was a perfect break after a long day of homework and classes. As the day wore on, Emily wanted to explore some of the trails near the falls. I was familiar with a few of them and tried to keep her on those. What I didn't account for was that she would insist on exploring some of the more outlying trails that we would consequently get lost. We spent nearly an hour walking in circles, our arms and legs getting covered in mosquito bites and our bathing suits drying uncomfortably onto our skin. We had the flashlights on our phone to give us a little light once the sun set, but they didn't do much to eliminate the dense undergrowth surrounding both sides of the trail. We finally came to a blackberry patch that we were pretty sure we had seen earlier, so by logical default we started heading down the path closest to the bushes. Emily kept asking me if I heard twigs snapping near us, and I brushed it off as a city girl being afraid of deer or rabbits. I didn't hear anything myself, so I figured she was feeling paranoid due to it being her first time lost in the woods. Then I heard it. The noise came from somewhere behind us, and it was too loud to be a small animal like a rabbit. I figured it was another person out walking, or maybe a herd of deer passing through. Stowe had never been a populous town, and the locals could argue that there was more deer than people in the area. I ignored the uneasy feeling building in the pit of my stomach, and kept walking, chalking it up to my friend's paranoia rubbing off on me and I babbled senselessly about cute guys to keep Emily and I distracted. After another ten minutes of walking, we finally came in sight of the trailhead. There was a large boulder there with a plaque on it, dedicated to a young woman who had been murdered at the falls back in 1991. And right beyond that was my car. As we neared the boulder, relief evident on Emily's face, a weird noise came from the woods behind us. It sounded almost like a cat, but it was distorted and static, like it was coming out of an old radio. My first instinct was the cat was wounded or in danger. I had always been an animal lover, and if there was a hurt cat, I wasn't about to leave it to become a coyote snack. I turned around, ignoring Emily begging me to just get in the car and peered back into the trail opening. I gave Emily the keys and told her to get our towels now that we knew where we were, and I promised I'd be back momentarily. If I didn't find the cat right away, I wasn't going to spend forever looking for it. But I couldn't just drive away either. With the loss of the second flashlight, the woods seemed a bit more eerie to me, and the darkness was nagging at my peripheral vision and I walked a little way down the paths. As I called out to the cat, hoping to locate it by its meow, but I didn't hear anything for several moments. I was about to give up when I heard a low, out-of-place laugh behind me. I spun around, my heart beating too fast, 
but all I saw was a large buck. I remember muttering something about stupid, sneaky deer. Then I headed back to the trailhead. That was when the deer laughed again, and I froze. <laughs> the harsh sound was completely unnatural. For those of you who don't know, deer make sounds like grunts, bleats, and snorts. They don't make any sort of laughter-like noise. And even if they did, it wouldn't have the same cadence as a human's laugh would. And this deer's did. This situation was weird and unnerving. I kept hoping that someone would pop their head out from around a tree and tell me it was a prank. That didn't happen. The deer took a few steps towards me, and then the odd cat sound came from it. I almost literally threw my hands up in a nope gesture and started walking away from it as quickly as I could. I was almost in sight of the end of the trail when I felt something snag my hair. I swatted it away, thinking it was a branch, since there were a lot of low-hanging trees along the trail but the sensation returned instantly. I reached up to tug my hair free, but it wouldn't come loose. I turned to face the offending tree, my heart thumping in shock. The deer, now on its hind legs, had my hair caught in one of its antler points. The snarls from a day of swimming and hiking were entangled around its antler, and I could feel its cold breath on my face. Not warm, not hot, but icy, cold breath wreathed around me. I let out the most shrill scream I had ever heard myself make, and I violently yanked my hair off its antlers. I sprinted for my car, screaming the whole way for Emily to start it. I heard the engine turn when I neared the boulder, and she didn't hesitate to floor it as soon as I was in the car. The tears streaming down my face were enough motivation. She didn't question me until we were nearly five miles from Moss Glen. I told her about the weird noises and the deer getting up in my face. I told her it startled me and that on top of the stress of being lost, that it was just enough to make me panic. She bought my explanation, agreeing that we were both just super tired and adding that my mind had probably played tricks on me. I haven't returned to Stowe since then, even though I visited Vermont recently. I know there's probably some sort of rational explanation for what I saw and heard that night, but I haven't been able to find what that would be. What I never told Emily that night was that the buck had fangs or how there had been blood on its mouth. I never shared that the huge animal was able to sneak up on me noiselessly, and I didn't bother telling her that it had the coldest breath I'd ever felt. She was my friend, but that didn't mean she would believe a crazy story. Emily, if you're hearing this, I hope you know I didn't want to lie. I was panicked. And in my 19-year-old mind, I didn't want to get labeled as a crazy or a liar. Please forgive me, and please never go back to Moss Glen alone. My Grandpa's Best Friend The hunting cabin was just as I remembered it. It was tiny, hardly bigger than a tool shed, and after a year of neglect, dust now coated every service. I hadn't been there in almost ten years, not since the last time I went hunting with my grandfather, Sebastian. I had been so terrified by the creature I saw in the woods that I hadn't wanted to return. My parents just assumed I was too bored to want to spend two weeks with a boring old man. Gramps still came to visit us, 
but thankfully we never went there. When Gramps passed away a year ago, he left the cabin and the 30 acres surrounding it to his only remaining grandchild. At 20 years old, I had never expected to set foot on the rural mountainside again, much less inherit it. But a bad breakup had left me the decision of moving into the cabin or into my parents' basement. The choice had almost been hard to make. The local newspaper, the Village Times, had claimed that Gramps died of a bear attack while out chopping firewood behind his cabin. I didn't buy that story, though. And even as I pulled my beat-up old Ford onto the unpaved driveway, I had my hand on my gun. The old Remington might not do much to the creature roaming those woods, but it made me feel better. I hadn't seen the thing in a decade, but if it was still around, then I would be prepared this time. Several hours later, I was unpacked, and the cabin was decently clean. All of the utilities were hooked up, and the refrigerator was stocked. I'd taken a week off of work so that I could adjust my new lifestyle, and I was planning on just relaxing the next few days. My first night and day passed uneventfully, but the second night, things were getting a little weird. I'd spent enough time in the country as a child to be familiar with creatures like raccoons, skunks, bears, and other mammals but the freshly made claw marks on the side of the cabin weren't anything I recognized. I woke up on my third morning to the gouges, and I was pretty unnerved. They were too large to belong to any small critter, too high up to be from a coyote, and too wide to be from a mountain lion or bear. In this neck of the woods, that ruled out everything logical. As I studied the claw marks, I wondered how I could have slept through them being made. They definitely hadn't been there when I first arrived, and the fresh marks stood out in bright contrast to the weathered wood of the cabin walls. I suppose a human could have made them with a knife, but I didn't have neighbors for miles. Who would be skulking around out there to prank me? It didn't make any sense. It crossed my mind that my ex might have done it just to freak me out. But Sandra lived almost 50 miles away and didn't have the address for the cabin in the first place. I don't use social media enough to bother listing my new address. And we didn't have friends in common or anything anyway. So I eventually shrugged myself and decided to let it go. I knew that worrying about it wouldn't help. But that afternoon... I found myself driving the ten miles into town and buying some motion-activated floodlights and a motion sensor camera. Two more nights passed, and each morning I woke up to the claw marks getting closer and closer to the cabin door. As much as I wanted to believe it was a stupid prank, I had to admit to myself that the evidence was overwhelmingly against the idea. The floodlights would turn on and the camera would snap. But all I ever saw in the photo was an empty yard. I had even tried to set up a video on my phone, but all it managed to capture was a vague blur of movement at the edge of the screen. I had had enough. On the fifth night, I went outside, gun in hand, and settled comfortably on the porch steps. There was no noise. No sound to indicate that the usual nocturnal creatures were up and about. I shut all the lights off and waited for the creature that I knew would come. Hours passed, and as 1 a.m. rolled around, I snapped myself out of a doze. I could hear something moving quietly, out by the edge of the woods where a figure was skulking around, its features hidden in the shadows. As the creature drew closer, I rubbed his eyes in disbelief. It was Sebastian, my supposedly dead grandpa. The unclothed figure paused in mid-step. 
its head slowly turning to face me after hearing me gasp in shock. Gramps looked sickly, with pale skin and visible ribs. He was bald now, his once Santa-like beard and hair gone. Gramps? I could hear the quiver in my voice, and my hands were shaking from terror. The gun had fallen to my lap, nearly forgotten, in the intensity of seeing my presumably dead grandfather. I had been so convinced that the antlered creature I had saw years ago had killed Sebastian that I had never once considered that my grandfather might still be alive. Gramps, what are you doing? Come home! Tears were streaming down my cheeks. I didn't care what my grandfather had been doing or why he was out there. All I cared about was that he was alive. I wanted to hug him again. Run, stupid boy. It's coming. Sebastian's voice barely sounded human. His warning came out as an almost reptilian hiss. And before I could respond, Gramps was bounding into the woods on all fours. He was gone in the blink of an eye. The bushes hardly swaying where he had passed through. The woods remained as eerily silent as they had been. Even through my grandfather's retreat should have made a large amount of noise. Not a second later, a low growl came from behind me. The sound reverberated off the cabin walls. A massive creature, the one from my memory, approached from around the side of the cabin. Within seconds, it became clear to me that it wasn't a human or an animal, unless someone was wearing an amazing costume. The creature was every bit as surreal as I remember it. Long, pale limbs sprouted from an emaciated torso, and the ivory deer skull shined in what little moonlight managed to bleed out through the clouds. It was wearing ragged old buckskin leggings and had beads around its neck. I couldn't see any eyes, but I knew without a doubt that it was staring directly at me. I think it was a wendigo or skinwalker, though the difference between the two types of monsters was always a bit beyond me. Before I could take any more details, the thing began to laugh, a guttural sound that echoed in my head hauntingly. <laughs> it was laughing so hard that it nearly doubled over, and I realized that its limbs were able to wrap around its body twice. I raised the gun and fired several shots at point-blank range. The bullets lodged firmly into the creature's neck and torso. The being looked down at its new piercings, and it began to dig out the bullets at an unhurried pace. It dropped them onto the ground like a child plucking flower petals, and it seemed to sigh in irritation as it dug out the last one. Why must humans always do this? It spoke such perfect English that I was dumbfounded. What was going on? What did the creature want? Had Gramps known about this? A horrendous-looking thing? My head began to ache with the strain of trying to figure it out. So I turned my attention back to the monster, the bullets clearly hadn't done more than annoy it, and I half expected it to lunge at me. No forthcoming apology? Hmm? It was still staring at me, its foot tapping impatiently as it waited. It shouldn't sound so human. I tried to say something, but my voice came out as more of a strangled squeak than my usual baritone. Well, I suppose that shall do. Now get along inside before that evil little denizen comes loping back. I just stood there, 
I tried to will my feet to move, but I was so scared that I felt my bladder give out instead. Warm pee ran down the side of my leg, and I, for just a second, my mortification overruled my terror. Oh, really now? Urination? Truly? Have you not conquered your basic instincts beyond this primitive farce? I... 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 It's not all about you, you know. Sebastian was a dear friend of mine, and one would think you would offer condolences instead of shooting me like a barbarian. You, you, you're a monster. Ah, uh, of course. Your simple little mind should be able to comprehend this more familiar form. A bit better. Suddenly the horrifying creature was gone, and its place stood Sebastian's best friend, Rufus. Rufus had been around as long as I could remember, and had always been a kind old man. He supposedly lived on the other side of the mountain, even though I had never actually seen any houses over there when Gramps and I would hunt. Rufus just always sort of appeared out of nowhere, usually startling us so bad we had almost shot him a few times. There, boy, is this better for ya? I merely nodded, still not trusting my voice. This was just a nightmare. I fruitlessly tried to convince myself that I must have dozed off on the porch and that I could probably wake myself up if I tried hard enough. I began pinching my exposed skin mercilessly, a bruise forming after a few rough grabs. Rufus was watching me, his head cocked to the side questioningly. What in tarnation are you doing, whippersnapper? I've got to wake myself up. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you, kid, but this ain't no dream. Now get your hide on inside for that thing that looks like your grandpappy. Comes back and guts ya. The scratch marks on the tree in the cabin are it claiming territory, but if it gets close enough to ya to mark your face, your dinner. I was shaking so hard from fear that I could barely move my limbs, but I managed to navigate the steps. I'm not entirely sure why I obeyed the creature, but seeing it morph into a familiar face was easier to deal with than the knowledge that it probably was about to eviscerate me with every step. I needed some semblance of normalcy, so I went about my usual pre-bed routine. I mindlessly made sure all the doors and windows were locked. Then I took a hot shower to help relax and clean myself up. I crawled into bed after, my adrenaline finally calming down. Now it I was just in pure shock, and then I noticed that I was repetitively reassuring myself that I would wake up and everything would be normal. Too bad even getting this written down hasn't managed to convince me that things are okay. Rufus said there were scratches on the trees outside, too, so in the next few days I'm going into the woods to find out just how far they extend. I have more questions than answers, but maybe I can at least find out more about Rufus. Like if he really does have a cabin nearby? I need to learn about what I'm dealing with, and I can't do that if I'm just keep cowering in my grandpa's cabin. I'm bringing my gun and buying a few more in town before I go in there, and I'll write down anything I discover about this crazy mess. So quoth, this raven. Oh, these stories were wonderful, and I really want a conclusion to the last one. My thanks to Alana.
And to you, thank you so much for coming to visit me in my little library. And a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Ermin Case, Darren and Jennifer Da, and Callisti Nick. If you like this, please hit the little button to let me know. If you didn't, hit the little button to let me know. Leave a comment. I'm always glad to talk with you, my darlings. I'm open to suggestions and criticisms, critiques. If you have not subscribed, please do so and ring the little bell so you know when to come up and see me. And I will talk to you next time, my darlings. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs>